Hey, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, ben gave a talk over at MSR a couple months ago and uh, happy to return the favor. I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing in uh, machine learning models that are specifically designed for healthcare, and I'll show you why I'm interested in these kinds of models. They're useful for other things as well, but healthcare is my motivating example. And let me just give credit to uh, some other people. This is a grad student from Cordell who's been working on this for now five years. This was his thesis. He graduated two years ago. He's now at a competing company, but we continue to collaborate. <laughs> uh, Johannes, friend, uh, professor at Cornell, who we now stole at Microsoft. Some other people at Microsoft, some people at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, Naomi's at Columbia. And then some other collaborators on some of the papers. So, uh, OK, so let me jump in. And I'm going to spend, it's more of a motivational talk. There's actually very little technical computer science detail in this talk. It's more motivation and demo. Um, OK, so let, let's jump in. So what's the best case? Somebody's given you like data for uh, 10 million, 100 million patients. They've given you thousands of great features for these patients. You know machine learning. So you train a state-of-the-art machine learning model. And the accuracy looks great. You get an ROC of like 0.95 or something on test data, which is unheard of in healthcare. You don't usually get ROCs that are that great. So now the question is, you know, everything seemed to go well. You know, great data, great features. The ROC looks unbelievable. You know, is it safe now to go ahead and deploy this model and actually use it on live patients? I mean, you know, what, what could go wrong? So, so I'm going to give you some sort of horror story of things that can go wrong. And it's going to be a real horror story from, from my experience. And then we're going to, using that, we're going to try to develop a method to get around those problems. OK, so this is what you've got. Uh, you've got a black box with an ROC 0.95. Maybe it's a deep neural net, or it's an ensemble of boosted trees, or something like that. But, but basically, this is what you've got. And you might think you've done some feature sensitivity analysis and have an idea of what's in the box. But you don't know what's in the box. And I'll, I'll show you how much you don't know about what's in the box. Um, so here's how I got involved in this. So back in the mid-90s when I was a grad student at CMU, so Arun and I overlapped at CMU for a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> back then I was working on this pneumonia risk prediction problem. So everybody has pneumonia. In fact, I've heard some people actually do have pneumonia right, right, right now. <laughs> everybody has pneumonia. And the goal is to determine if you're high risk or low risk. High risk, we definitely put you in the hospital. About 10% of people with pneumonia die from it, so it's serious. But if you're low risk, in fact, the best care is uh, chicken soup, antibiotics, call us in three days if you're not feeling better. So, so that would be actually the safest care for most people with pneumonia. Be treated as an outpatient. OK, so we had this data from the mid-90s. And our goal, one of our goals was to compare various machine learning algorithms that were avail available back then to see how well they did on this risk prediction problem. So we didn't have some of the new high flyers, you know, like deep learning and boosted trees. Uh, so we had things like rule-based learning, k-nearest neighbor, neural nets, and Bayesian methods, hierarchical mixture of experts, so th things like that. And I got very lucky. So I was working at the time on multitask learning. Um, and I got lucky in that uh, of all the different groups who were working on this data set, I won. My model had the highest ROC, the, the most accurate model we could train. And at some point, we started talking about whether we could or should use this model on, on patients. I stopped them. I actually said, no, we should not use an ensemble of neural nets on patients, and I'll tell you why. So instead, what we did was we ended up, uh, on real patients, we ended up using logistic regression, one of the poor performing models <laughs> on this data. And, and I'll tell you why we did that. OK, one of my friends, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, who worked with um, uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Buchanan at the University of Pittsburgh, was training rule-based learning, which was much more common back in the mid-90s. He was training rule-based learning. And he said, you know, Rich, I learned a funny rule last night. I learned this rule has asthma, lowers your risk of dying from pneumonia. So it's actually good to be asthmatic if you have pneumonia. It lowers your risk. And he said, boy, that seems really weird. So we brought it up at the, the big meeting with the doctors. Uh, and the doctors thought for a second and said, you know, it's probably true in our data. Um, we consider asthma you know, a serious risk <laughs> factor for pneumonia. If you, uh, if you present with pneumonia, you have a history of asthma, we, we not only put you right in the hospital, but back in the mid-90s, we probably would have put you in the ICU. So, so you got this really aggressive treatment if you had a history of asthma and now you have pneumonia. Um, you probably also got to healthcare faster because you also already have a history of you know, lung impairment. 
Um, so and the good news is that, you know, like chalk one up for the doctors for healthcare is that that treatment, that aggressive treatment is so effective, it actually lowers your chance of dying from pneumonia if you have, have asthma, right? Because you actually get exceptionally good care. There's also a certain selection bias here. It turns out asthmatics tend to be younger patients um, in a data set from the mid-90s. Most of the World War II generation you know, probably wouldn't have asthma on their medical record, whereas people born in the 70s, 80s, and 90s you, you know, would have asthma perhaps on their record. So. so there's a selection bias, and then there's this great care that the asthmatics receive, and they probably get to care faster. Now, the problem is, if a rule-based system learned it, and it didn't have an ROC as good as the neural net, and if it's a real pattern in the data, well, guaranteed my multitask neural net learned it as well. But it's just in there somewhere in the neural net. The only reason we know about this problem is because something very intelligible, like a rule-based system, learned it, not because we understood the neural net. And I told him, you know, I probably could go fix the neural net. I could like do research, publish a few more papers, and figure out how to get this out of the neural net so that it wouldn't do that. Uh, and I said, but the biggest problem is what did the neural net learn that the rule-based system didn't learn that would be just as worrisome? So, you know, in the example I like to use, this is a made-up example. It's not, not relevant to our data, but uh, suppose uh, pregnant women who have pneumonia also receive, like, great care. There's also a selection bias. They would tend to be younger patients. So suppose, you, you know, they also receive this phenomenal care, and then the model learns that uh, pregnant women have lower risk. Uh, and what we wanted to do, to give you an idea how bad this could be, one of the things we wanted to do with the model was use it to decide who to admit to the hospital or not. As a risk predictor, we were thinking about using this model to decide if you were high risk, you should go in the hospital, low risk, you shouldn't. You can see that this model would tend to say asthmatics were lower risk, and actually shouldn't go into the hospital. The exact opposite of what the care was that they were receiving, that was causing them to be uh, more successful. So, Okay, so that's a real problem. And I would, it's not easy to make this problem go away. Even worse, it's not even, to, it's not even easy to know you have this problem. Right? If it weren't for the rule-based system, we wouldn't have even known that we had this problem. My summary of this, you know, my take-home message is, you really have to be able to understand what's in these models or else you're at risk of, of doing harm to, to patients. In, in any sort of mission critical use of machine learning, uh, you know, controlling a nuclear power plant, autonomous vehicles driving on the road, uh, that, that might be mission critical. Uh, certainly in healthcare, you really have to understand what's in these models or you're gonna make mistakes. And the mistake we're gonna make, realize it's not that the neural net has done anything wrong, it's that the data is not the data you would actually want to use to learn this kind of a problem. But the reality is you will never have the data that you want to have. It's not ethical for us to do a clinical trial where we withhold this treatment from asthmatics. We wouldn't even know in advance that we needed to do the clinical trial that way. We would never have the right data set to do machine learning, quote, correctly uh, for this problem. So and I, I think that as we move forward, we're doing more and more stuff with these large observational data sets that are collected. All of this real kind of complexity is in those data sets. And as we go and use them for things for which they were never carefully designed to support, our models are going to make many, many such mistakes. Um, and as I'll show you, this, this model actually made other mistakes that we didn't know about at the time. And feel free to ask questions during the, during the talk. So. so I think this is very clear, but also not surprising at all. I think you're absolutely right. As usual, statisticians are like 20 or 30 years ahead of us, uh, in those of us in machine learning. And in fact, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, unfortunately, statisticians don't have a solution to this problem either, right? If you work with a data set that happens to be some observational data set with 100,000 records in it, you're just going to have all sorts of complex associations in the data which have more to do with how the data was collected than it has to do with what you're trying to do with the data. And as we go forward, it looks like less and less often we'll be, be collecting data specifically for what we want to do. And in this case, I don't think you could collect the right data. So you have to have some sort of approach. And I'm going to punt. I mean, let's face it, if we had causality, this would go away, right? Because you would recognize the true causal structure between the treatment the patients received 
the fact that pneumonia is not actually causing them to be low risk, it's causing them to receive treatment, which then makes them low risk. Right? If you knew the causal structure, that would be a solution to this. Um, unfortunately, causality is very hard, especially from observational data. So, so I, we don't have some magic bullet, and I don't believe statisticians have a magic bullet for this either, especially not a magic bullet for recognizing the problem in the first place. Um, if I were to tell statisticians about this, I think they do have methods which could now be used to try to remove the asthma effect. Um, the problem is knowing about it in the first place. And what I've finally decided to do after you know, a decade or two of being annoyed by this um, is I've decided to work on methods where the method would be so open box that I would be able to see these problems and then decide whether at least to use the model or possibly have a mechanism for trying to intervene and fix the fix them all. Yeah. I guess I'm there's a little connection between the, this being a problem of open box versus closed box. Right. Uh, right. Versus seeing that you have data and you want to fix the data perfectly and learn the rules that would make sense in the data. Right. Except that you're gonna try to use some other right. to <clears throat> take an action that's gonna change the distribution of the data. So the model is yeah. good 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 question. It turns out, so the rule-based learning is very open box. We can read the rule-based system. We can scan down the rules and say, oh, that rule looks questionable. That looks questionable. These others look pretty good. So, so it's very open box compared to the neural net where who knows what's in it. The other thing with the rule-based learning is it's modular enough that you could see this asthma rule and you could decide to remove it. Uh, so you actually have some way to edit the model. Now, I'm not saying that this would be perfect, um, but at least at least something being open box gives you opportunities for recognizing that you have problems uh, and then possibly being able to fix those problems. And that's the direction we're going to go. And you know, why is logistic regression so, so trusted in the medical community? Because it's also open box, right? It's, it's weights on variables. And you can sort of see positive weight <laughs> means risk goes up, negative weight it goes, you know, and then you can edit those things as well. So and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's just the right question. Okay, so the goal of what we're trying to do is, you know, it's always annoyed me that the most accurate machine learning methods tend to be the least complex. So what we're trying to do is develop a, a machine learning method that's as safe to use as, you know, as open boxes logistic regression, but hopefully much more accurate. It's, it's more accurate like neural nets and, and boosted trees and things like that. So, so that's what we're trying to do. I mean, ultimately, I guess I'm trying to replace logistic regression as the standard method. Uh, in healthcare, so um, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, space of complexity. You, you know, we can have models which are low complexity; they'll often have higher intelligibility. But then, unfortunately, low complexity often means lower accuracy. And then we can flip that; we can get high complexity. Sadly, right now, high complexity usually means low intelligibility, uh, but you get the advantage of high accuracy. And there's a chance that this is like you know, a fundamental property of information theory, right? It, it could be it's like Planck's constant. You know, you can't know the position and momentum of the electron at the same time to arbitrary accuracy. You have to pick one. And it could be you have to pick accuracy or intelligibility, and you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And hopefully I'll show you some results where at least it'll suggest that Planck's constant in this uh, realm is very small, so we can have pretty high accuracy and pretty good intelligibility. So, so that's what we're trying to do. So let, let's talk about this, and I'll introduce our model class. So we've got very simple things like linear and logistic regression, you know, which we're all familiar with. Uh, and unfortunately, these things tend not to be as accurate on many problems. And then we've got much more complex things like random forests and boosted trees and neural nets. Uh, often, those are more accurate, but sadly, they're really not intelligible. It's, it's funny, you know, a single tree of modest size is, is pretty intelligible. It's almost as intelligible as rules. Unfortunately, unfortunately, once these get big and you make an ensemble of a thousand of them, you lose that intelligibility. So, so, so sadly, the very thing that makes these things accurate enough to use them is what makes them unintelligible, so uh, making an ensemble of them. So we've got this space that goes from linear models to these full complexity models. And fortunately, there is something in between. So here's an additive model. So if the linear model is a weight times a feature plus a weight times a feature, then an additive model is something like a weight times a function of a feature plus a weight times a function of a feature. And these functions of the features, they're functions of just individual features. So this is a function just of, say, age. And it can be an arbitrarily complex function. It can be multimodal. It can do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, but it's still just a function of a single feature. And that tremendously restricts the complexity of this model. 
It also so it turns out that's part of what makes the model intelligible too. Now we can go beyond this. So instead of just functions of individual features, this sum is the sum of all functions of individual features. And then this sum is the sum over all pairs of features. So this lets us have pairwise interactions. So these are functions that shape the interaction of some pair of features. And then we can you know, carry that get further. We can do functions of triples of features, three-way interactions. And if we go all the way to the you know, n-way interactions, if we have n features, then we have full complexity again. We can, we can do anything. What we're going to do is we're going to restrict ourselves to basically mainly functions of individual features plus a few uh, pairwise interactions. And we're going to restrict ourselves to that space, not because we believe that's necessarily the most accurate subspace to restrict ourselves to, but because it's an intelligible subspace. And then we're going to do everything we can to make this as accurate as possible. OK, so this is called uh, generalized additive models with interactions. Uh, I didn't invent this, uh, so the statisticians, once again, were 30 years ahead of us. Uh, so there's a very nice book from 1989 or 1990 on these generalized additive models. So th these things have a rich history in the statistics community. And I think our contribution is really just going to be a couple things. One, we're going to put full machine learning computer science horsepower behind these things. We're going to make them fly as high as they can fly. We're always going to do that while forcing whatever we do to remain intelligible. So our main job is not high accuracy. First our job is intelligibility, then high accuracy is our secondary goal. Uh, and you're going to see that uh, we're going to use a model class that makes them particularly appropriate for the kinds of things we're using. And it's just a model class that the statisticians tended not to use. It's going to be tree-based. So. Um, but, but anyway, the, the, it's really fun to go back and read a book like this. Uh, which is sort of when I started learning machine learning. And these guys already knew about all of these issues, you, you, you know, 30, 30 years ago. So that's great. So let me talk a little bit about the shaping of a feature that we're talking about, this f of x1 kind of thing. So, you know, a lot of uh, variables in healthcare are things like body temperature, pulse, partial pressure of CO2 or oxygen in your blood, things like that. And for many of these things, there's a normal range. Like body temperature, 37C is good. That's considered healthy. If you're at a, you know, 40C, that's very high fever. That's, that's high risk. But you're also high risk if you're 34C. You're hypothermic. So, so you're sort of high risk, normal, high risk again, right? So you've got this graph that, that's high risk if you're outside of the normal range. And a lot of variables are like that in biology and healthcare. Um, and of course, uh, things like logistic regression, linear models can't handle this because they can't have something be high, low, and high, or vice versa, right? They, they can't do that. So what would be the standard way of handling this in logistic regression? And it's exactly what we did 25 years ago when working on this data is, you would take a variable like uh, body temperature and you would create multiple Booleans. So you would have a, a body temperature normal. You would have a mild fever, high fever, very high fever, mild hypothermia, high mild, high, high hypothermia, right? You, so you might take body temperature and create a half a dozen, at most a dozen Boolean variables out of it. Only one of them would ever be true for you at a time. You would have one temperature, so one of these would be hot, no pun intended, and the others would be, would be zero. And then what you do is you learn a logistic regression model on top of these things, and it learns that, wow, high fever is very high risk. It puts a big weight in front of it. Uh, mild fever is actually not high risk, so it puts a low weight in front of that. Normal body temperature isn't, high ri isn't risky at all. It puts actually a negative weight in front of that because it's good. So, so it would learn that sort of thing. Now the problem with this sort of approach is, uh, one, you need human experts to figure out how to discretize the variables. So uh, the other thing is the model gets more complicated. Um, so it turns out that what was a single variable like body temperature, which is easy to understand, has now become a half a dozen or a dozen variables. And you're going to do this for many different variables. So suddenly the model, you know, it explodes in complexity. So it makes it hard to actually understand this. And it turns out you do lose some accuracy when you do this sort of manual discretization. So if we take our very algorithm, apply it to the expertly crafted uh, bins for, for these kinds of variables, we still lose a half a point of RSE compared to what our algorithm is going to do. And I'll show you that in a second. OK, so this is the pneumonia features. You can see some of the discretizations. This is actually from our paper years ago. So you can see, oh, here's body temperature. 
Normal is considered 35.6 to 38.3. This bin is considered high. That's considered very high. For some reason, they decided that uh, the hypothermia needed more bins than, in fact, fever. You know, it's, it's human expertization, uh, discretization. Uh, this sort of discretization is used in a lot of papers uh, that use this data. So, and you can see that, Less sure. Less than 34.4, is that also known as dead? <laughs> <laughs> uh, cer cer certainly risky, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can actually get recovered from that if you get appropriate care. But uh, uh, and I only know that because I sail in the area. And <laughs> if you're if you're going to do any water sports in Seattle, you should you should learn about this end of the spectrum. <laughs> so, um, okay. So uh, for continuous variables, you can imagine that we can do something better than this sort of create a bunch of booleans, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so let me just give you a thought experiment. Imagine I give you a data set. I ignore that for now. I give you a data set with six variables, and you can perfectly model this data set with linear regression, logistic regression, right? So, so it is a linear data set. I give you a sample of data. There's not too much noise in it. You'll recover the linear coefficients, and you'll do very well. And then suppose, unbeknownst to you, what I do is I transform some of the variables. I do things like uh, I take the square root of x2, and I take uh, x squared of x3, and I do a sign transformation on x5 or, or something like that. So I, I take these variables, which were very well modeled linearly, and now I apply some, some funny transformation to it. Now you go apply a linear model to it, and of course you can't get it right anymore because you can't represent these transformations. If, however, you could learn shape functions that would try to figure out what shape or transformation should I apply to each variable in order to make it work well with linear logistic regression, then if you learn those shape functions appropriately, you would actually undo the transformations that I had done to the data and not told you about. And suddenly you'd be back to a linear problem and you'd be able to do very well with linear regression. And that's exactly what these additive and generalized additive models do, is they attempt to learn these sort of shape transformation functions that convert each variable or maybe pairs of variables back to something which can be well modeled with now a linear a linear additive model like logistic regression. So, so that's what we're going to do. Now, we're not going to do it this way. We're not going to have something which has a model class like, oh, you're allowed to use sines and cosines and square roots and exponentials. We're not going to do it that way. Instead, we're all you know, machine learning people, so we're going to use just good old machine learning curve fitting with trees and things like that. And we're going to let it build any shape function it thinks it needs. And I'll show you what those shape functions look like. OK, so this is a sketch of the algorithm. This is, this is the most computer science-y this <laughs> talk is going to get. Um, so what do we do? The, the first thing we do is we build the best additive model we can where we shape individual features. So we're going to take all the individual features, throw our algorithm at it, it gets to shape the individual features, and then it tries to build a logistic regression model on top of those reshaped individual features. Then we're going to calculate the residual to the targets. Now imagine that uh, Imagine that um, you did the shaping perfectly in stage one, and you know, let's say there's no noise. Well, what could be left in the residuals? If there's no noise and there were no errors in the targets, and you did stage one perfectly, it turns out the only thing that can be left is some sort of interaction between terms, like pairwise interactions or three-way interactions. Because otherwise, the linear shaped functions would have captured everything that wasn't interaction. And if there's no noise, then there's no noise. So now all we would be left with when we calculate this residual is some sort of interaction. And then we've invented an algorithm that's very, very fast at uh, searching through the order n squared pairwise interactions to find the few pairwise interactions that look like you should pay some attention to them. We want the model to be intelligible. So you know, if you've got 1,000 features in a model, uh, well, 1,000 squared over 2 right, is a large number of pairs. So we don't want the model to suddenly blow up and, and have a million extra terms in it for these pairwise interactions. So instead, we're just going to look for the very few, maybe a dozen or at most 100 pairwise interactions that look like they are most important. And then we'll put them in the model. And then our model will try to shape those pairs in a way that it works well with logistic regression. And then we'll actually stop there, because if we go to three-way interactions, it, it turns out the model becomes unintelligible. And all this will make much more sense in a minute when I show you an actual model. We've been playing with a couple different data sets. I'll talk about two of them today. One's this, I got permission to go back and use the pneumonia data set from the mid-90s. So it was a lot of fun to revisit this data set that I knew so incredibly well. I, I spent 
God, you know, two years of my life as a grad student on this data set. Uh, so it's really fun to sort of revisit an old girlfriend uh, and get back to this data. Um, and then this is a much more modern data set. This is a modest sized data set. By, mod by, by standards back then, it was pretty big, 15,000 patients, 50 variables. Um, but this is a more modern data set. Here we've got uh, 100,000 patients per year. And this is all-cause 30-day hospital readmission, which is you've been in the hospital, you've been released. Uh, what are the chances that you have to come back to the hospital within the next 30 days? And hospitals are being penalized now for this in the U.S. If you have to, if you have too many patients who have to come back within 30 days, it probably means you didn't do something right <laughs> uh, for all of those patients, you know, during their last visit. So, and this is really different because this is all cause, right? People are in the hospital because they were in a car accident, they were in a bike accident, they have cancer, they had children. They had pneumonia, right? I mean, people are in the hospital for many, many different reasons here. Some of these patients are young, some are old, right? It's a much more complex data set than, than this. So I'll show you some results on these things. All right, so the rest of the presentation is essentially like demo. I, I want to jump into these models and show you what they can do. Um, can, can I ask a question? Sure. There was one part of what you're saying which I didn't quite get, which is, can you go back to the algorithm? Maybe? So, you're saying that, right, you want to compute these uh, shaping functions for each individual variables, and you said that the possible space of shape functions isn't as esoteric as allowing sine and cosine or square root. So I guess my question is, what is the space of oh, shaping okay. functions, great, and great, then great, kind great. of how do you... Sure, sure. Because you're simultaneously computing the shaping, uh, shaping functions for all the variables. That, that's exactly right. And in fact, it's very important that you do it simultaneously so that you don't multiple count evidence and so that the shape of one variable is in the context of the shaping that you're doing for other variables. Since variables, I'm going to use the word interact, but I don't mean interaction in the strong pairwise interaction sense. Uh, variables are correlated with each other and have effects on each other that are different from interactions. Interaction is like parity, or ex exclusive or. It's a, it's a different thing. But, uh, so, so the algorithm that we're using um, right now is based on trees. So what we do is... Uh, no whiteboard here. Oh, okay, cool. So um, what we do is we, this is uh, x1, x2, x3, xn. These are your features. And what we do is we grow a little tiny tree for x1. So in, this tree is trying to predict, in the pneumonia case, lives or dies. So it's, it's going after the targets, trying to predict it from x1. Little tiny tree. Then we, and it has a low weight on it, like 0.0001, okay? And then we go to X2, and we grow a little tiny tree. And it is working on the residual after you subtract out the little bit that this thing could have learned uh, to, a, to predict the target. So this is working on the residual of this. Then you grow a little tiny tree here, and then a little tiny tree here, little tiny tree here. Everything is working on the residual of the previous things. And then we sort of repeat rinse and wash. So now we grow another little tiny tree, another little tiny tree, another little tiny tree. And we keep doing this. And everything, all the, these trees up here are still here. And we keep doing layers and layers, you know, iterations and iterations of growing these very tiny trees. Each of these has very low, low weight in front of them. So what we're trying to do is sneak up incredibly slowly on learning a function that is a tree-shaped function of each of these variables. Now think about it, if these trees can only use x3, they can't do any sort of interaction between x3 and anything else. So what we can do at the end is we can take all the trees, and we might have 10,000 trees, little tiny trees, that we've grown for x3. We can take all of those trees, and you can just add them all up together and make a single tree out of them if you want. But what we're going to do is actually go beyond making a single tree. If you think about it, the sum of all these things is just a bunch of cut points on something, maybe this is age. So it's a bunch of different cut points on age. And you get all these leaf nodes. And each leaf node predicts a value. And you add up the values of all these overlapping little bins, effectively, that the trees have created. What's it give you? It gives you a graph. <laughs> it gives you a graph where age is on this axis. And you have all these little bins that are from the cut points of all the trees. And then you get the average or aggregate response of all those trees, and that's what you get for age. And then the beauty is, if this is a blood pressure, you're learning uh, the shape 
with these trees that are restricted to age, at the same time you're learning a shape function which is restricted to blood pressure, at the same time you're learning a shape function which is restricted to partial pressure of oxygen, and you sort of slowly creep up on these shape functions uh, for all of the different features. And because of the way we force the algorithm to work, they're all being learned essentially in parallel, even though it's sequential, the learning rate is so small, we're, we're effectively doing it in parallel by using these very low learning rates. Everything is being learned together, sort of simultaneously, because it's always looking at the residual of everything else that's already in the model. And then because of the way we've done the construction, none of these things can wear, learn any pairwise or higher order interactions, because all of the trees are restricted to working on a single feature at a time. So it turns out that this algorithm gives us the properties that we want. Uh, and we just do these little tiny trees in these very low weights to make sure that it does it very gradually. So it makes it actually kind of expensive. Like logistic regression would be you know, instantaneous on this data. This will actually take a half an hour. Um, but, it, but it works. Yeah. Uh, what's the residual? So the residual is the, uh, take the sum of all the predictions of each of these terms and then subtract that sum of predictions from the targets. And that's the residual. It's the part of the target, the lives or dieness in the pneumonia case that you have yet to predict correctly. So that, that's the residual. And you know, like all machine learning, the goal is to you know, drive the residual to zero if you can do it in a way that generalizes well. Right, so. Misclassification error on the training set, is that another term for residual? Uh, it's not necessarily an error. The residuals, suppose all the residuals uh, were very, very small. So suppose the largest residual across all the data was 0.01. Well, now you've predicted everything. Everything in the data is either a 1 or a 0. They either lived or died. And if the largest residual you have after applying this model to all of the data is 0.01, well, that means you predicted 0.99 or higher for all the people who died and 0.01 or less for all the people who were zeros. That would be fantastic. I mean, we should get so lucky as to maybe on the training set this would happen. But if it happened on the training set, it would be a sign of massive overfitting. Uh, now, on real test data, we'll never have residuals. Re residuals is like the squared error that's unexplained. It's the variance unexplained by the model in statistics terms. It would be the squared error, if it was a neural net, it would be the squared error that our model makes uh, on test data. That would be the residual. And, you know, backprop is uh, error-driven learning. It's always trying essentially to drive the residual, the, the unexplained part of the target, to, to zero if it can in such a way, hopefully, that, that doesn't overfit. Yeah. So the thing I find surprising in what you said, and maybe it's because I'm not understanding it well, is I would have expected as you're going through this process with the variables, there'd be some strong notion of regularization. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To simplify so that yeah. the age doesn't end up being all these little sub-ranges. Right, 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 right. Right, right, right. No, it's, it's a great question. And there is strong regularization in here, but I've kind of hidden it. The strong regularization is the fact that these trees are restricted to being so small. We found that the, empirically, that the most effective regularization we could apply to these trees was besides having very small weight on any one tree. So, so one, I mean, a lot of the regularization is coming from the fact that it's an ensemble of thousands of trees for each variable. So, so right away, ensembles are you, you know, the world's best data-driven regularizer. But the other thing we're doing is we're forcing each of the little terms in the model to be incredibly small. So no one of these things can go kind of crazy. They can at most do one or two splits on the data. And then it turns out once you take the average of these, so, so think about it, maybe we have a tree uh, and it splits at 0.7. And if you're to the left of 0.7, it predicts uh, 0.8. And if you're to the right, it predicts uh, 0.03. And then we have another tree. Um, I'll make this one slightly more complicated. This one puts a 0.5 up there, and here there's a 0.2. And if you get to this left branch, um, if you get to this left branch, it puts a, a 0.05. If you get to this branch, it puts a 0.13. And if you get here, it puts a 0.48. Now, if you think about it, we can take this and we can figure out. First of all, the first one, this is a 0 to 1. Let, let's just assume the variable goes from 0 to 1. Um, so if you think about it, you know we have to have a cut at 0.7. So there's going to have to be a cut. And if some case comes in and it's to the left, it's going to get a 0.8 here. And if it goes over there, it's going to get a 0.03. 
And then this one says, well, you know, there's a cut at 0.5, and then there's a cut at 0.2. So it's, it's placed these additional cuts. And if you went all the way below 0.2, it gave you a 0.05. And if you went here, you got a 0.13. And if you went over there, you got a 0.48. And if you think about it now, we can just add up all of these things, right? The only way you ended up here was a 0.05. Here you end up with the average of these two things. Here you end up with the average of a, what's that, a 0.03 and a 0.4. Um, you know, so you just, you just do the sums. You do the average of all these trees. And a lot of the regularization is coming from this averaging process of all of these things. But how would you contrast what you just described, which I'm not exactly sure what it uh -huh. to, but I understand the flavor of it. There's something where you say, look, if I've got a continuous range, let's take age, it's certainly possible that you know, younger kids below the age of seven, right. older people above the age of 70 right. um, you know, have, are high risk and people right. in the middle have lower risk. Right. What's not possible for any reason is that two to five is like this, five to eight is like that, and then you know, eight to 10 looks like two to five, these kinds it's, of cuts. So it, effectively, you, you, right, you right. Um, have a strong prior that yeah. there's uh, continuity, yeah. and anything that violates the fact that there's a small number of contiguous zones right. in the variable is noise. It's a, it's a great question. I can't wait to show you the graph, because it's a beautiful segue to, to the graph that we're about to look at. The tree cuts will tend to do the kinds of things you're asking for. That is, if it can't see any difference between patients who are under some age, who are all presumably lower risk, then it'll just tend not to put any cuts down there, and you'll end up with this big region to the left, which ends up being essentially youth. Um, also, it turns out one of the things we do want uh, is the ability for the model to occasionally make jumps, because it'll turn out jumps are actually real sometimes, and, and I'll show you some of those. And it's one of the limitations of the spline functions that statisticians would typically have used for this, is that the spline functions are restricted to being very smooth in a way that's actually not realistic. So, but, but I'll show you the graphs. And c come back to this, this question if you're not satisfied. So I think it's a, it's a perfect question. And it is why we use trees under the hood, because they can hopefully give us our cake and eat it too. We, we want the ability to occasionally have jumps if they're real, and trees are willing to do that. But we also want this smoothness. And one of the things that's uh, work that we still have to focus on is how to impose more regularization on these models. And I'll, I'll make a joke about that uh, in a couple minutes. So, so these questions are perfect. OK. Just so you know, oh, sure. Uh, so is this accurate to say stage one is kind of like is gradient reboosting, but for more interesting stuff than the models that gradient boosting is there? If you were to do gradient boosting, where every tree was only allowed to use a single variable, then it actually, in fact, our first implementation was with gradient boosting on trees restricted to single variables. And you will get pretty much the right thing by, by doing that. When you get to the pairs, now it turns out you want to do something a little more sophisticated. And it turns out this method easily generalizes to pairs as well, whereas gradient boosting, you'd have to now modify it to make it do the right thing in pairs. But your intuition is, is correct, that it, especially for stage one. This really can be implemented as gradient boosting, and it will work. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So could you replace the full like, decision tree learning with something like kernel regression? Like some yes, other yes, numbers? yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, one of the reasons why, and we have a bunch of KDD papers on the you know, complex machinery that's under the hood. One of the reasons I don't emphasize it as much in, in this sort of presentation is I don't have any reason to believe that the way we're doing it is like the right way or the optimal way. I mean, we certainly have no theoretical guarantees. We were just looking for a certain set of properties. This was the first idea that seemed to work pretty well, so this is what we're using. I think there are many other ways to do this, and I'll, I'm willing to bet that some of them are better than what we're doing. So, so we're not in any way trying to convince people that they would have to use this specific algorithm. It's the big picture of these generalized additive models with certain properties restricted to single features and pairs and how we go about displaying them intelligibly. That's the sort of real story. And then this sort of detail is how we're getting it to work right now. We would love to think that there are better ways of doing this. And we'd be thrilled if other people were to come in and say, ah, this method's stupid for the following reason. Here's a better way. And that, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So don't get, uh, don't get hung up that this is like the best way to do it. It's, it's not. Okay, 
The stuff works pretty well. Uh, this is a big surprise to me. Um, so this is just a made up scale on the bottom here. But imagine that logistic regression, linear regression gets like 0.8 on your typical UC Irvine problem. And imagine really complex things like burst, boosted trees and deep neural nets you know, do 0.9. They do much better. Well, if we just shape on UC Irvine problems, um, if we just do shaping of individual features, we already get half of that gain. So we, we cut the gap in half by just shaping individual features. And then if we're allowed to shape pairs of features, we actually get you know, 90% of the remaining gap. So ultimately, we get 95% of the gap between linear models and full complexity models by doing this and just restricting ourselves to pairs. Now, every now and then, there's a data set where this will not work. Like if you have a robot arm with three degrees of freedom, three degrees of freedom, three degrees of freedom, and your goal is to predict where the end effector is as a function of those nine join angles, well, that's a nine-way interaction. There's, there's no way this will do you know, exceptionally well. It actually does better than you might think, but there's no way you can nail that problem. You actually need a nine-way interaction to do it right. Fortunately, nature, especially in healthcare, doesn't give us many nine-way interactions. So, so we, we actually, on healthcare data, we do actually much better, better. In fact, our models, when we shape pairs, so far in healthcare are doing as well as anything else. You know, there's a lot of noise in healthcare. There's a sort of a noise ceiling. And we're doing just as well as anything else, which is, which is great. Um, but in other domains like UC Irvine, you are going to have to accept a small loss compared to other state-of-the-art algorithms in order to pay the toll for the intelligibility that you're going to get. So, OK. Our model only does this interesting shaping on continuous features. If you've got Boolean features, it is just logistic regression which I think is a good thing, right? It, it becomes what people are used to uh, if you've got Boolean features. And it's only going to do interesting stuff on these continuous features. This is the continuous features in the pneumonia data set where these Cs are. So you can see right away half of the variables in the pneumonia data set are Boolean. So nothing interesting is going to happen there. So, All right. This is a real graph. This is age. This is for pneumonia risk prediction. Let me tell you about this graph. We're going to look at a few graphs, and, and then we're done. OK, so we've got in this data set, uh, the youngest patients are 18. So you had to be an adult to be in this data set. Uh, so this is age going from 18 to just over 100. This is a risk score on the vertical axis. So think of this as being like log odds. Um, so the higher up, the higher your chances of dying. The lower down, the, the better for you. Being below 0 is good. What 0 would mean on this thing, let's see. So 0, the model seems to say that if you're about 70, that's a zero. What a zero means is that compared to other people, you're neither at higher or lower risk because of this variable. Like it doesn't raise your risk, it doesn't lower your risk. You're just the baseline rate. Now remember the baseline rate in this data set is about a 10% chance of dying. So you'd actually like to be lower than 10% as opposed to 10%. But, but it basically says that you know, all other things being equal, uh, being 70 means that you have about baseline rate. So let, let's look at the graph. And the way you use this is there'll be you know, uh, 50 graphs like this, one for each variable. And you really do like you find where you're, everybody can look up your own age now on this graph. <laughs> so you look up your age. You go up. You read the score. You write the number down. You go to the next graph, blood pressure. Find your blood pressure. Go across. Read the score. Write that number down. You take the sum of all those numbers. And then you just do 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x squared. Right? You just do completely standard conversion to a probability. And that is the model. There's nothing else. This is not an approximation of some more complex model. This is actually the model. So, so let's talk about what it's learned. Well, first of all, Aaron, you were <laughs> predicting this. It's good to be young. right? And the model says, yeah, young is around under 50. So, <laughs> so so basically, as far as pneumonia risk is concerned, being under 50 is great. And in fact, it looks like the trees, because this, there is a slight jump there and a slight there's, But basically, the trees have not been doing any real cutting for patients who are less than 50. They're, they're pretty safe. Oh, by the way, this is a histogram, the density of the patients in terms of age on the bottom. So you can see we do have patients here. Most of the patients, as you'd expect in the hospital, are, are sort of middle to elderly, with very few patients who are very old. Um, OK, so it's good to be young. Then, you know, things start to happen. <laughs> uh, you start slowly increasing in risk. Something very interesting happens. So at, uh, in this data set, at about 67, 
or so, there's a jump in risk. Mid-90s, this is retirement age. So the model knows nothing about retirement, right? It's not one of the variables. It's never been told anything. It's just trying to, you know, create a function that's appropriate for age. And it seems to be detecting retirement age. Now, the bad news is that when you retire, your risk seems to go up. As a, you know, we might have hoped that it would go the other way. But uh, <laughs> um, so, so it's interesting. I mean, at retirement, you know, multiple things happen, right? Your daily activity changes. Uh, your health care insurance probably changes. Your provider might change. Your access to health care changes, right? So, so a number of things do change here at retirement. And somehow it seems to have a big effect. And then as you grow older, the risk increases much more dramatically, right? Oh, and these error bars, these are pseudo error bars. What we do is we bag the process, you know, 10 or 100 times to just sort of get an idea of the variance between different runs of the algorithm with different random seeds. These are not real error bars. So just they're, they just give us a vague idea of how confident the model is in different regions. And you can see there's lots of patients here, so the error bars are smaller. It also thinks it knows this trend very, very well. Whereas out here, there are a few patients, uh, and uh, over here, there's very few patients. So give you an idea what those error bars mean. Then something interesting happens. So your you know, high risk is increasing somewhat dramatically as you get older. And then there's this funny jump at 85 or 86. And there's a chance, if you look at the error bars, that that's not real. But it's, it's probably real. So there's nothing in the healthcare code. Uh, that says, you know, at 85, we should change qualitatively the care that we provide. So, so there's no, no rules like that. And I doubt your genome, you know, knows that you've suddenly hit 86. So, so while none of the experts that I've talked to have admitted it, what it probably is, is a sort of, you know, unwritten social convention, which is, might have been especially true in the mid-90s, which is, you know, you're getting kind of old at 86. Uh, you know, gran Grandpa's already had two rounds of antibiotics. He's still extremely sick. Uh, perhaps we should let Grandpa pass, you know, as opposed to making further aggressive treatment. And pneumonia is sometimes called the old man's friend because you're actually going through systems failure. You're, you're getting sick in many, many ways. Pneumonia is something you then catch, and pneumonia often finishes you off quickly, you know, so instead of having a sort of long lingering wasting death, you know, pneumonia can, can cause this to happen quickly. In fact, one of my advisors, Herb Simon, uh, died of pneumonia. Ultimately, that was the cause at around this age. So, so, so who knows? Um, but there's a chance that this is a social convention that's being detected by the model that has nothing to do with, you know, strict uh, health care. Then risk seems to be sort of flat. And then I don't know if this is real. The error bars are now very, very big here. There are very few patients out over 100. Um, the model seems to show a drop in risk. And when talking to people, this shows up in other models as well. Like this is not unique to this model. Um, there's a chance that it's what's called uh, successful agers. These are people who have specific genetic traits that let them actually you know, weather old age you know, better than most of us. <laughs> um, so they actually do well. I think there's a good chance that this is actually another social convention. You made it this far, we're not going to give up on you now. So, so there's a chance that that's what the model is, is seeing. OK, now, some comments about the model. I mean, you know, this, this is almost certainly retirement, right? I mean, it's just such an easy explanation. By the way, the model's not causal. It's good old standard machine learning. There's no causality here. So be careful not to overinterpret this. I'm just saying one possible explanation for why the risk score jumps here is because of retirement. One possible explanation for that is because of a sort of social convention that especially in the mid-90s, if you were hitting sort of over 85, that you were maybe getting old enough that we would stop uh, using aggressive treatment for you. And then maybe this is the sort of, we're not going to give up on you now if you've gotten this far kind of effect. Here's the interesting thing. This is the model. This is what the model has learned for age. There is nothing else hidden. This is not approximation to some other model. You really can just have these graphs. I could put these graphs on paper. You could apply this model to a new patient by going to each page, finding where that patient fits, writing down the number, adding up all the numbers, and convert to a probability. That, that really is everything. But here's the cool thing. 
This model is just as accurate as any other model we know how to train on this data set. It's as, comp it's as accurate as the multitask learning neural net. It's as accurate as boosted trees. It's actually slightly more accurate than both of those models, but ignore that. It's, it's as accurate. This model has learned some interesting things. We're already starting asking interesting questions like, well, is this retirement? It seems like, boy, below 50, there's really no variation in risk. That's kind of interesting. Maybe we should look into that. <laughs> Maybe we don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, boy, it would be fun to figure out what this is. We're actually, so here's a model that's just as accurate as any other model we can train on the data. And all of a sudden, all of us completely understand what the model is doing with age. It's not that this is correct. If we were to change some of the other variables in the model, this would move around a little bit. So, so don't think of this as being, it's certainly not causal. And there's no reason to think it's correct or truth, but it is what the model thinks. And we all understand this model. It's just as accurate as anything else. And we're even sort of generating hypotheses about what the model might be thinking or why it has done this. And that's a remarkable thing, I think. The, the fact that we have a model that is this accurate, and yet we completely sort of understand this, this, the, what the model thinks about this variable. It's a great question. I haven't done the analysis, and I need to do that analysis. Yeah. No, it's, it's exactly the, the right next step that we should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. If you have, if you have two correlated variables, yes. Then yes. You get the same yeah. Yeah. You know, so there's an interesting question. Suppose we took age and we made another copy of it and called it, you know, age two or something like that. The model would never know it was another copy of age. Now you'd have two perfectly correlated variables. And what our algorithm would tend to do just by accident is it would tend to come up with two similar graphs for both of them and put half weight on each, which you know, in this case, you'd almost rather it picked one and put zero weight on the other. Um, yeah, with I mean, correlation in high dimensional spaces, first of all, it's ubiquitous. There's no way to be in a high dimensional space without massive correlation among the variables. And it's like from the devil. I mean, correlation is something that's very hard to deal with and make go away. And I think if there is any ultimate limit to the intelligibility of these models, it is the correlation problem. Now, realize you can completely understand what the model thinks and how it makes its predictions. That correlation doesn't make that complex, because you really do just add up a bunch of numbers. And the problem is the relationship between the model and reality is affected by correlation. So and again, I, we've got to be very careful not to overinterpret these things as being sort of reality or truth or correct. And correlation is the main cause of these things being mismatched to reality. Yeah. Yeah, Cor correlation is a nasty problem. We don't have a, a real solution to it. I will mention one thing about correlation, though, that'll come up in a slide or two. OK, so that's age. This is what we learned for age. And this is what statisticians, if they had used their favorite spline software, would have learned. It would have been a linear model, just that risk increases with age. And I guess my comment would be, you know, statisticians historically have been too conservative, right? They, they don't add something to the model unless there's like a 95% confidence that, that it really needs to be there. Um, and this is our model, which I think I, in this case, prefer this graph. Now, this is what we learned for pH. <clears throat> Normal pH is actually down here, and there's this complex detail. And I think this graph is unnecessarily complex. So this is where we, we should have some more regularization, probably, in our model. This is what statisticians would have learned with splines for this. I think this is actually still too simple. Qualitatively, it's roughly right. But, but you know, I don't know. Like, I don't really prefer either of these graphs. I'd, I'd prefer something more in the middle. Um, so as machine learning practitioners, I think we tend to be too high variance. And this is sort of my joke about that, is that uh, you know, statisticians sort of approach the edge of the precipice very cautiously. And they actually never get there. Like, the 95% confidence interval pr prevents them from getting to the edge. And machine learning people like me, you know, we're lemmings. We, we run full speed, jump off the cliff. And then we hope that something like cross-validation will save us before we crash and burn at the bottom. And in fact, the best thing would be, you know, the best view is right at the edge of the cliff, not in the water or, or back here. Um, the best thing, of course, would be something in the middle. And, and that's what we're trying to do is push back the, we're trying to regularize our models better so that we can push back sort of more towards the edge. But that's just my joke about statisticians versus machine learning people. This is an age plot that we learned for 30-day readmission. Okay, so 
we do have patients now who are under 18. It is a qualitatively similar graph, so let me just show you some of the similarity. Age 18 to 50 is reasonably flat, then risk sort of rises. There's a jump at retirement age. Sadly, it's a modern data set. Retirement age is now older <laughs> than it used to be in the mid-90s, so we, we're not allowed to retire as early as we used to, so it, it actually has sensed that. Then risk does something a little more complicated here, and then it rises rapidly, and then maybe there's even this hint of people over 100 sort of having slightly lower risk. Qualitatively, that part of the graph is pretty similar, even though the data set is, this data set couldn't be more different than that other, <clears throat> than that other data set. So, so it's remarkable, actually, to see that degree of similarity. And this is not only all cause, so there's you know, a thousand different reasons for having been in the hospital, but this is being learned uh, in concert with 4,000 other variables at the same time. It's a very variable rich data set. So the fact that age looks this similar is kind of remarkable to me. And then something interesting happens. The largest effect actually is this negative spike near zero. So, so let's look at that for a second. You'll notice there's a lot of population density down at zero. Uh, it turns out this, and I've just blown up z age zero to two. It turns out a lot of us, a lot of us are born as patients into the hospital. Um, so, so, and the interesting thing is that the safest thing you can do for age is be born. And most of us are born healthy. We don't have complications. We are born into the hospital. We're born as an inpatient. We get released from the hospital, and the vast majority of us will not have to come back to the hospital, at least not for a long time. So for 30-day readmission, in fact, the safest thing you can do is be born. And once again, this model doesn't know anything about birth or any of that sort of stuff, right? It's just looking at statistics on a variable that has these properties, and, and this is what it's learning. So it's learning something very interesting. It seems to learn that there is these sort of conditions of being an infant of early childhood, which do make you at slightly higher risk for having to, to readmit to the hospital. And then it goes back down, and it's essentially flat until you hit adolescence, when risk definitely goes up again. And then once you get sort of 18 to 24, the risk goes back down and stays flat until you start hitting 50s and you know, climbing the, the mountain at the other end of the graph. So. Which we should have warned you, we're, we're out of time. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so in fact, I will wrap up. Um, I just will show you one interaction. This is an inter interaction between age and whether you have cancer or not. This is if you have cancer or don't have cancer. It's a very surprising interaction. It says your highest risk if you have cancer and you're young. This is the pneumonia data set. It's actually kind of sad. So what's happened is, in that data set, remember, you're not in the data unless you're over 18. What has happened is that you've had cancer as a child. So, so you've had like teenage cancer or something like that, which you know are very aggressively treated uh, childhood cancers. Sadly, you're still labeled as having cancer, which means you're not considered to have been cured of that cancer yet. And now you have pneumonia or you wouldn't be in this data set. And it turns out having a cancer, which has been aggressively treated, which has not yet been cured, and now you have pneumonia, that is a high risk. For you. So, so unfortunately, these are young patients not yet cured of their cancer who now have pneumonia, and in fact, they're at high risk. So and this is an interaction. You could only learn this. Um, it turns out that having cancer does not actually make you at high risk of dying from pneumonia in general. It's only if you have cancer and you're young that it makes you high risk. OK. We also learned other funny things, like a history of chest pain lowers risk and a history of heart disease lowers risk. Those should all seem just as weird as having asthma lowers risk. Turns out it's all the same effect. Here's the weird thing about this kind of model. If you get these sorts of things, you want to keep these variables in the model. You want it to learn the bad association. And then after training, you want to just set zero weight to those terms. So you, and you don't want to retrain the model. Because if you retrain the model, and there's correlation between variables like asthma and chronic chest pain and other variables, re realize this asthma lowers risk is real in the data. If there's correlation between asthma and other variables, and you take away the asthma variable, it'll just learn to get that fix as much as possible through the correlation with other variables. And you won't even know it's there, let alone have a way to handle it. So you actually intentionally want to leave in variables that you're most concerned about. If you're worried your model will learn something about race, put race in as a variable. Let it learn whatever it learns, and then put a zero weight in front of it. That's the right thing to do. OK, pretty much done. I, I could show you, 
I'll show you one graph and we're, we're essentially done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so feel free to get, get up and go. So, you know, on the 30 day readmission, the other thing we can do is I'm showing you the model. The other thing we can do is you're a specific patient. We can sort all 4,000 terms by how much they increase or decrease your risk. And it turns out but just looking at the few terms that make you highest risk, it really tells us a lot about why you are in the hospital or why you're at high risk. So the models are actually intelligible, not just from a sort of here's, can I understand the whole model? They're actually intelligible from the individual predictions that they make for individual patients. So, but, but that actually is it. Uh, the next slide was the summary, so.